October 1776. Benjamin Franklin prepares for his voyage to France. His only living sister is convinced that she will never see him again. I cannot bear the thought of you going abroad again. You positively must not go. You've served the public beyond any other man. Into your old age. Let some younger person now take on this painful work. Do as much good here as Congress thinks proper. Your talents are certainly superior to other men. But brother, don't go. Pray, don't go. With great secrecy, Franklin leaves Philadelphia on a ship aptly named the Reprisal. His mission is of the utmost urgency. The Americans don't have a hope of winning the revolution unless they can secure an alliance with England's most powerful rival, France. I think that the whole endeavor was stark staring mad. Franklin has to do this impossible thing, or this almost impossible thing, to persuade the French to join this war. As much as the fate of the revolution is in George Washington's hands with the army on land, it's with Franklin as he crosses the sea. I will do anything my fellow citizens think proper. As the shopkeeper says about his short ends of cloth, use me for anything you want. I'm old and good for nothing but rags. In 1776, Benjamin Franklin is 70 years old. His wife and most of his contemporaries are dead. But far from retiring, he is about to face one of the most difficult challenges of his long life. Before setting off for France, he had been in the forefront of the revolutionary cause. In June, he had assisted in the writing of the Declaration of Independence. Now in October, the war is in full cry, and so far has been disastrous for the new nation. George Washington's army has suffered decisive defeats at Long Island, White Plains, Fort Washington, and Fort Lee. Britain has the most well-disciplined, well-supplied, well-stocked army and navy in the world. America has virtually nothing. America was just this sort of young, new, marginal place. We couldn't beat the most powerful nation on the planet without someone's help. It just wasn't going to happen. If the Americans got French help, preeminently an Ameri a French alliance, French weapons, then the revolution had a chance of succeeding. If the Americans did not get French help, the American Revolution almost certainly would fail. We were incredibly fortunate that Franklin was willing to do it. There's no diplomatic core in existence. There's barely a government. So that it has, it has to be an informal, personal mission. And Franklin, because he had the personal recognition over there, was the one diplomat who could do it. When Franklin arrives in Paris in December 1776, it is a far cry from the city of light, the wide open boulevards and stunning architecture of later years. The average Parisian lives in abject poverty, in narrow crooked streets with open sewers running down the middle. Starving beggars and homeless families are everywhere. In the elegant mansions near the Tuileries Gardens, where the poor are forbidden to go, the upper classes prepare for their soirees. No elegant face is complete without the application of at least one mouche, originally used to disguise smallpox scars. Elaborate wigs are placed over bald heads 
shaven to discourage lice. At Versailles, King Louis XVI and his queen, Marie Antoinette, preside over a world of idle luxury. This is the society to which the former printer from Philadelphia will have to gain access. He already has one powerful weapon, his reputation. The general public in Paris already then idolized Franklin. People had read Poor Richard, they had they knew about the way to wealth, they knew about his writings, they were very proud that the theory of electricity and lightning had been proved in France for the first time. He was the embodiment of all they thought America to be. There was a vogue for things American in France at this time. Many French intellectuals looked to America as a new world, as a fresh world, as a world where human nature was closer to its natural origins than the human nature that one found in the confines of Europe. And so Franklin arrived from America, and presumably he shared some of this noble, savage character. Franklin is kind of the natural genius whose development has not been fettered by a European court. He's flourished. His intellect has, has sprung beautiful shoots in the American wilderness. And the French are absolutely entranced by this kind of native genius. The most surprising thing is the contrast between the luxury of our capital, the, the elegance of our fashions, the, the magnificence of Versailles, the polite haughtiness of our nobility, and Benjamin Franklin. Everything about him announces the simplicity and innocence of the natural man. His clothing is rustic. His bearing is simple but dignified. His language is direct and his hair unpowdered. Such a person uh, is made to excite curiosity in Paris. Uh, people cluster around him as he walks down the street and ask, who is this old peasant who has such a noble air? Franklin wants to oblige their expectations. He decides to present himself as an authentic American rustic. They want it, they'll get it. He is the American from central casting. When Franklin first arrives in France, he is wearing a fur hat, simply to keep his head warm. The frontiersman's hat causes a sensation. For the French, it is proof that its wearer is a true, natural man. Franklin, who has never lived out of a city, now sends back to Pennsylvania for great supplies of these coonskin caps that he's never worn in his life. All the attention surprises even the master publicist himself. He writes with amusement to his daughter. My picture is everywhere, on the lids of snuff boxes, on rings, busts. The numbers sold are incredible. My portrait's a bestseller. You have prints and copies of prints and copies of copies spread everywhere. Your father's face is now as well known as the man in the moon. Franklin's mission is top secret. He is ostensibly visiting France as a private citizen. From the moment of his arrival, all Paris has been abuzz with rumors. Nobody really knows what he is up to. Lord Stormont, British ambassador to the French court, reports back to London. Some people think that the famous Dr. Franklin has come to France on personal business. I am convinced he is here on some secret mission from Congress. He is a devious man, incapable of truth, and will, I am sure, try to draw the French into openly supporting the cause of the rebels. He is very well regarded by general opinion and has excellent connections at court. In a word, my lord, I look upon him as a dangerous enemy, and I only regret that some English warship did not meet up with him on his way here. The British ambassador has good reason to worry. Franklin soon attempts to make official contact with the French court. To the French foreign minister, Le Comte de Vergennes. Sir, we request an audience with your excellency in order to present our credentials. 
We beg to acquaint Your Excellency that we are fully empowered by the Congress of the United States to negotiate a treaty of friendship and commerce between our two countries. Charles Gravier, Le Comte de Vergennes, Minister of Foreign Affairs to the Court of Louis XVI, is the key man Franklin will have to deal with in his efforts to get support from the French. Mr. Franklin's conversation is civil and sweet. He seems to be a man of much wit, talent and intelligence, but careful, very careful. This does not surprise me. Vergennes, like Franklin, is quiet, hardworking, avuncular, a relatively elderly man, uh, one of the few members of the French aristocracy that had married for love and almost lost his diplomatic career as a result of it. A man picked by the king because the king didn't expect so quiet and cautious and prudent a man would make waves, whereas in fact, like Franklin, Vergennes was a zealot. Vergennes is an ardent nationalist, eager for France to resume her rightful place as Europe's greatest power. In the 18th century, there are two great world powers, and they are France and England. They had been at war with each other as rivals, and the English had defeated the French in the French and Indian War. And they were fighting over world domination, in essence. France is uh, arguably the world's greatest military power, but had lost the last war uh, in a big way to the British. And of course, French policy is one of whenever the opportunity arises, recouping that loss. But whether they were ready to go to war is, is, was the crucial question. The government was not in the best financial shape in the world. In fact, uh, uh, Turgot, the great minister of finance, had warned Louis XVI, the king, that the first gunshot will bankrupt the state. Vergennes knows that France is not yet ready for a full-scale war, and that King Louis will have to be convinced that the Americans are worthy of French help. Proceeding with caution, he agrees to meet with Franklin and his co-commissioners, but only in secret. Vergennes makes it clear that France will be prepared to fully back the young nation only if there is a real chance of winning. Naturally, the French are uh, reluctant. As eager as they were to seek revenge, they're reluctant to get themselves caught if the Americans should suddenly settle with the British and the, the French find themselves in a, in a world war with, with Britain without the support of the Americans. So there's a good deal of suspicion uh, of, on the part of the French whether the Americans have the stuff to make this revolution stick. Vergen tells Franklin that France will provide aid under the table, but there will be no alliance for the Americans, at least not yet. Franklin knows that his stay in France is going to be a long one. A wealthy friend, Le Ré de Chaumont, offers the use of his country estate at Passy. It is strategically situated one half mile outside of Paris and just a short carriage ride from the court of Versailles. And uh, he proceeded to hold a kind of salon there. He entertained important people and generally operated as a uh, a representative uh, of, a, of a foreign country. He was like an ambassador without a formal portfolio, even though he spoke, incidentally, terrible French. In social terms, he found friends among the Parisian intellectuals and the Parisian intelligentsia. He ingratiated himself with all those folks who were willing to have him over to their homes for dinner, to invite him to their salon. Americans, like the British, generally hate the French. The French are their traditional enemies, despised Roman Catholics, fops and frog eaters. But Franklin, unlike most of his provincial countrymen, is a true man of the world and finds French society utterly congenial. This is the most civilized nation on earth. The first people you meet here try to find out what you like so they can tell others. If you tell someone that you like mutton, then at every meal they serve you mutton. Someone, it seems, 
gave out the information that I love the ladies. So now everyone presents me with their ladies, or ladies present themselves to be embrassés. That is, to have their necks kissed. Kissing a young lady's lips is considered rude, and kissing her cheeks might rub off the paint. He begins to just lay groundwork everywhere. He's willing to go to any salon. He's willing to talk with anybody. He's willing to do whatever is available to him to be done. You must remember that there was no foreign service. There was no tradition. This was one of his chief inventions, so to say. He had to create this system as he went. His basic idea was very simple. He thought, the only way I can obtain help for America is in having these French see, eventually, that it is in their interest to help us. And that will take some time. I think what you have during his embassy in Paris, there at Passy, is the fulfillment of everything that he'd ever acquired in his life before that. All of the skills in dealing with people, all the skills in psyching out where people are coming from, what they want, what they need, what they live by, how to play the game so as to curry favor with them, how to ingratiate yourself with them, all of that, all the manipulativeness, all of the cunning, all of the way of getting around people, all of the adaptability, all of the waiting for the right moment. I think in every way that embassy to France was the culmination, was the pinnacle of his entire life. For over a year, Franklin and Vergen do a curious diplomatic dance. Franklin wants an official alliance with France, but is careful not to pressure Vergen for what he cannot give. And the minister continues to send small amounts of money and arms to America. It all has to take place very unofficially, with a wink and a nod. The British are aware that something is going on between Franklin and Vergen. They have a network of spies who send weekly reports back to London by leaving drops of supposed love letters in a hollow tree in the Tuileries Gardens. In the blank spaces of the letters, written in invisible ink, are the real messages. John Le Carré would have loved Paris in the 1780s. It's full of spies and moles and counter spies. Franklin's own secretary, Edward Bancroft, was a spy in the pay of the British government, but was also spying for the Americans at times. He's the secretary of the legation. It's crazy. Some of the reports sent back by England's breathless spies border on science fiction. We have discovered that the doctor, with the assistance of French technicians, is in the process of building a great number of reflecting mirrors, which will concentrate so much heat from the sun as to be able to destroy anything by fire at a considerable distance. The apparatus is to be set up at Calais on the French coast, whereby they mean to burn and destroy the British Navy sitting in our harbors. And more. The doctor proposes a conducting chain linking Calais to Dover. He will connect it to a prodigious electrical machine of his invention and convey a powerful shock to explode our entire island. Franklin is well aware that both the British and French have spies everywhere, but he remains philosophical. It's impossible to uncover the falsity of pretended friends. If I was sure that my valet was a spy, as he probably is, I wouldn't dream of discharging him for that fact, if, of course, he was a good valet. With the help of Le Ré de Chaumont's liveried servants, Franklin entertains great numbers of visitors, including a young American, Elkanah Watson. I was invited to dine with Dr. Franklin at Passy, I was very embarrassed, not knowing any French and being dressed in the American style. We entered a large room where I saw several extremely well-dressed people bowing to us. 
As an unsophisticated American, I bowed back to each one of them until Dr. Franklin kindly informed me that they were the servants. Now, all the guests greeted the wise old man in the most affectionate manner, some kissing him on both cheeks, for men kiss in France. One young lady called him Papa. I had been expecting great ceremony, but everyone was free and cheerful. Franklin, never the Puritan moralist, greatly enjoys flirting, and this enjoyment is thoroughly reciprocated. One favorite is a neighbor, the elegant, beautiful, intelligent, and married 33-year-old Madame Brion de Jouy. Franklin calls her la brillante, the brilliant. For four years, Franklin spends almost every Wednesday and Saturday evening at her house. She offers him tea, concerts, elegant dinners, and games of chess. In between visits, they write letters to one another. Madame la brillante. They say there are only 10 commandments, but I think there are really 12. The 11th is that we should increase and multiply, and the 12th, I suggest, is that we should love one another. Tell me, my dear, if my religiously keeping these extra two commandments compensates for my breaking one of the ten, the one which forbids me from coveting my neighbor's wife, which I confess I break constantly. I understand it's the belief of certain fathers of the church that one of the most effective ways of getting rid of a temptation is to satisfy it. Pray instruct me, my lovely confessor, how far I may venture to practice this theory. Though Franklin is twice his neighbor's age, Madame Brion is only too happy to play this game. On the subject of lust, all great men are tainted with it and call it a weakness, but it's not. You're kind and lovable and you're loved in return. What's wrong with that? Go on doing great things and loving pretty women, provided, of course, you obey my three commandments. Always love God, America, and above all, moi. Franklin understood what a reputation he had as a ladies' man. And in fact, his reputation exceeded the reality, as Franklin himself knew. But Franklin understood that a reputation as a ladies' man, especially if you were in your 70s, was something that the French just loved. You couldn't be a politician in France unless you had relationships with influential women. They call them the salonniers. And, and these women ran these salons where everybody who was anybody came. And at, at one point, there was a, a, a salon where 300 women gathered around Franklin and they placed a crown on his head. And don't think these women didn't go home and tell their husbands, uh, I think the France should become the ally of America, and they had influence. So he was always being the diplomat, even while he was charming the ladies of France. In the evening, one of Franklin's favorite pastimes is chess. One night he plays a long game by the bathtub where Madame Brion is soaking. The next day he apologizes to his neighbor that he was so deeply absorbed that he fears he has let her get waterlogged. For Franklin, chess is more than a game. In life and in chess, we have points to gain, adversaries to deal with, and a large variety of good or bad things which we bring on ourselves by our own prudence or lack of it. In playing chess, for example, we learn to plan for the future. The player is always thinking, if I move this piece, what will be the advantage of my new situation? What use can my adversary make of it? You learn to survey the whole chessboard, the relations of the several pieces, the dangers they're exposed to, and the several possibilities of their aiding each other. You learn caution, not to make your move too quickly, lest you put yourself in a bad position, and must live with your rashness. Lastly, you learn from chess the habit of not getting discouraged, even when, for the moment, you find yourself in a state of seemingly insurmountable difficulty. After six months in France, 
Franklin has made no progress in bringing the French into the war. From America, he is receiving frantic appeals for the most basic of supplies, but no money to pay for them. Franklin often became exceedingly frustrated at what he was asked to do, continually to provide monetary resources, weapons, boots, ammunition, all of this stuff for the American army, essentially to keep the Continental Army in the field. And he had almost nothing to work with. In many cases, he was simply dealing with private French contractors, and he was asking them to ship goods to the American colonies on credit, on the credit of the Continental Congress, credit which was rapidly disintegrating. The amount of work that Franklin had to do was significant. We think of him having a good time in France, and he did to some extent, but he also worked very hard, and he was getting tired. Franklin's fellow Americans are not making his job any easier. He is one of three co-commissioners appointed by Congress to negotiate with the French. One of the commissioners, Silas Dean, has been accused of embezzling funds. The other, Arthur Lee, is suspicious of Franklin to the point of paranoia. Lee has been spreading ugly gossip about Franklin to his allies in Congress. Franklin's very powerful enemies used every indiscretion that he ever committed to portray him as a, as a, a, a man who just was a skirt chaser and uh, that sort of thing. And there were rumors, rather vicious ones, that he made a lot of money under the table, et cetera, et cetera. In addition, Lee has been bombarding Franklin with criticisms of the way he has been running the delegation. After months of Lee's constant sniping, Franklin can bear it no longer. It's true I've not answered your letters. I have received and borne your magisterial snubbings and rebukes in silence. I'm old and don't have long to live. I have much to do and no time for these sort of quarrels. I'm worried about the success of our mission, which is hurt by your sick mind that is forever torturing itself with jealousies and suspicions and fantasies that everyone means you wrong or fails to respect you. If you don't cure yourself of these ravings, you'll end up insane. God preserve you from so terrible an evil, and for his sake and mine, pray suffer me to live in peace. But Franklin, as usual, prefers to keep his frustrations private. The letter to Lee will remain unsent. He says at some point in uh, one of Poor Richard's almanacs, let all men know thee, but no man know thee thoroughly. Men ford easily where they see the shallows. So you have to keep a part of yourself, maybe a large part of yourself, hidden from the world. In the dreary French autumn of 1777, Franklin is getting nothing but bad news from America. Washington has suffered a string of military defeats. Fort Ticonderoga has been captured. The British General Burgoyne is on his way to controlling the entire Hudson Valley. New York, too, is under British control. The worst news they heard was that General Howe had captured Philadelphia, and that was Franklin's hometown, his children, and all his papers were now in British hands. It was really crushing, and yet he kept up a bold front, and when someone said to him, uh, I hear that uh, General Howe has captured Philadelphia, Franklin said, no, no, you have it wrong. Philadelphia has captured Howe, which was Nice, nice bravado, but it still, it still wasn't uh, very good news. Franklin knows that without French military intervention, the United States will continue to lose battles. And the more they lose, the less likely it is that Vergennes will agree to intervene. It is an impossible situation. The French will not begin a quarrel with England as long as they can avoid it nor will they give us any open assistance of ships 
or troops. Indeed, we're scarcely allowed to admit that the French are giving us any aid at all. Well, this leaves America the glory of working out her deliverance by her own effort and bravery. From now on, we'd be well advised to depend chiefly on God's blessing and not that of King Louis. Just as Franklin is almost ready to give up, an American messenger is on his way from the port of Nantes with the latest news from America. I didn't have time to get off my horse when Franklin shouted to me, did Howe really take Philadelphia? Yes, sir, I said. And the poor gentleman sadly shook his head and was heading back to the house. I stopped him. But, sir, I have greater news than that. General Burgoyne and his whole army are prisoners of war. In a military operation which astounds the Europeans, an army of American farmers has defeated a large invasion force at Saratoga. Crack British and Hessian troops who have rarely lost a battle anywhere in the world. Franklin makes sure every influential person in Paris gets the news, starting with Vergennes. The circumstances are now more favorable for the establishment of an understanding between France and the United Colonies of North America. The prospect of an alliance between France and America terrifies the British. King George will do anything to avoid this. The many instances of Franklin's malevolent behavior convince me that hatred of this country is the constant object of his mind. Yet it is so desirable to end the war with America in order to avenge the insolent conduct of the French that I think it proper to keep open the channel of intercourse with that insidious man. The British decide to send out peace feelers and dispatch an agent to meet with Franklin. For several weeks, Vergen has been stalling, and Franklin fears the alliance with France will come too late to save the revolution. He makes a brilliant move. He sees an opportunity to use the British willingness to negotiate to force events with Vergen. Franklin, while he was in Paris, was engaged in a complicated maneuver to make the French think that the American states might cozy back up to the British, to make the British think that the Americans were getting what they wanted from the French, all the while playing from a position of weakness. For Franklin, the chess master, the game is always being played. And there are always 16 or 32 moves to be thinking of in advance. Sometimes he would get stuck in a position where he was obviously in a losing position, and he would arrange to distract his opponent. He wasn't above moving the pieces. Franklin agrees to meet with the British agent. He makes sure that Vergen will find out about the meeting and suspect that Franklin is secretly entertaining a British peace proposal. In fact, Franklin has no intention of making peace with England. We know what really took place at the meeting because the agent, an American loyalist, reports every word spoken back to the British. He uses a code in which numbers are substituted for key words. I called on 7-2. He received me very kindly at first. I told him that I wished to be honored with a temper of 4-5 on the terms of a possible reconciliation. He told me how unsatisfactory previous informal attempts had been. He considered them time lost. And now it was a matter of lives lost. And as he spoke, he worked himself up into a fury of resentment against our country and king. I suggested to him that any private resentment he had about something that had happened to him personally while he was in Britain should be controlled for the good of his country. I flattered him and told him that he was too great a person to let private quarrels be mixed with the public good. The effect was to rouse the old man, who, as we know, is constitutionally calm and unemotional, to the passion of a high-mettled youth. I've never seen him so eccentric and so diffuse as he was today. He told me that other countries were wiser than 6-4 and ready to deal with 4-5,
and that the savages of North America were more reasonable than the savages of Great Britain. And, and then he went off on the barbarity of Englishmen. At this point, he was almost breaking into a sweat. I said to him that I was here for instructions, not for insults. I said that the people of 6-4 were prepared for a 10-year 207. His answer was that America would endure a 50-year 207 before she would ever, ever give up 107. Vergen has no idea what really went on at the meeting, but Franklin's tactic spurs him into action. We put the question directly to Mr. Franklin. What must France do to block the commissioners from listening to any new proposals of peace from England? He answered that America had long been asking for a treaty of friendship and commerce between our two countries. The immediate conclusion of such a treaty would remove all uncertainties. On February 6, 1778, a treaty of alliance between France and the United States is signed in Paris. It is not just a matter of open French aid. Formal recognition by one of the world's two superpowers gives legitimacy to the shaky idea of independence. Franklin has accomplished the first goal of his mission. For the signing of the treaty, he wears a strangely unfashionable coat of Manchester velvet. It is the very same coat that he had worn during his humiliation before the British Privy Council four years earlier. Revenge is sweet, and for Franklin, very personal. He writes to his old friend, Katie Ray. Your troubles will not last much longer. We have formed an alliance with the French. This will serve to keep the English bull quiet and make him behave himself. His horns have been shortened. On March 20th, 1778, King Louis XVI, among the most powerful men in the world, formally receives the American commissioners at Versailles. Playing his role perfectly, Franklin flouts all court protocol. The natural man wears no sword and no wig. The king spoke with great sincerity. A sure congress, he said, of my friendship. I hope this treaty will benefit both our nations. Then Mr. Franklin spoke. Your Majesty, he said, can count on Congress. And so, France is the first to recognize the independence of the United States. The fact that France signs a treaty and in effect therefore acknowledges the independence of British colonies is a remarkable milestone in history. This is a king who has agreed to support a revolution against another legitimate king. Really very unusual and in some ways, you know, if you want to give credit, bold and farsighted on the part of the French, but really I think they were tricked into it by Franklin. The treaty is also, and most importantly, a military alliance. France declares war on England. France's ally Spain eventually joins the war as well. But the Europeans have their own priorities, which are not necessarily those of the United States. The French aren't as interested in creating the new American Republic as they are in humiliating the British. And so they spend, initially spend a lot of their time down in the West Indies, sacking the West Indies and making money from, from destroying uh, English Caribbean colonies. Their goal is not to create the United States of America. Their goal is to break up the British Empire. Franklin's task now is to keep the pressure up, to convince the French to send troops and ships to America. The rebels might win a few battles, but as the war drags on, his countrymen are dying. Dear brother, the British have evacuated Philadelphia, and it seems that they have done little damage. I hope they never return. My son Benjamin disappeared soon after the Battle of Trenton and has not been heard of since. And God has taken poor Peter. 
Of the 17 children our father had, you and I, my dear brother, are now the only ones left. May I live to see the happiness of your children's children and peace for America. During Franklin's long stay in France, he keeps up his lifelong interest in science. It is in France that he witnesses one of the world's first lighter-than-air balloons rising over the Champ de Mars. He develops a plan for daylight savings time. He studies the phenomenon of hailstorms in the summertime and speculates about the temperature of the upper atmosphere. He has the ingenious idea of combining two sets of lenses, thus inventing bifocals. I wear my spectacles constantly. With these, I only have to move my eyes up or down to see distinctly near and far. As one of the world's foremost scientists, Franklin serves on a commission to evaluate the theories of Anton Mesmer. Mesmer claims to have discovered a new magnetic life force which can send people into a hypnotic trance. Franklin debunks the idea that mesmerism has anything to do with magnetism. Franklin is now the honored guest at all sorts of public functions. A prominent mason, he initiates the philosopher Voltaire as a member of the Lodge of the Nine Sisters. He is a man of means and is able to indulge in all the luxuries that Paris has to offer. He did not live a parsimonious, frugal life over in France. He had a remarkably well-stocked wine cellar. The arm of man, said Franklin, is exactly the right length to lift a wine goblet up to his mouth and drink. That is the purpose of the arm, is to drink wine. Franklin believes that the prodigious intake of wine and rich food is the cause of his gout, an agonizing joint disease. One bout sends him to bed with a fever and extreme pain for over two weeks. When he can finally hobble out of bed, he sends this little playlet to Madame Brion. Ooh. Ah. What have I done, Madame Gout, to deserve these cruel sufferings? <laughs> Many things, sir. You eat and drink too freely and you don't exercise. I do. Ah, 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 oh. As much exercise as I can, Madame Gout. But my work forces me to be sedentary. Forces you? Let's look at your day. You wake up in the morning, eat a huge breakfast, tea with cream, one or two buttered toasts, and then a few slices of dried beef. Is this good for the digestion? And then what do you do? You sit down at your desk and you don't move until dinner. And after dinner, do you walk in the garden with your beautiful lady friend? Oh, no. You play chess. I take rides in my carriage. You call that exercise, the swaying of a carriage suspended on springs? You should thank me, Mr. Franklin. I'm the one who keeps you healthy by administering my wholesome corrections. So take that twinge and that. In the spring of 1778, a new commissioner is making his way to Paris. He has been sent by Congress to replace Silas Dean. John Adams, Puritan from Braintree, Massachusetts, is not as taken with France as Franklin is. He sees it as a test of his immortal soul. There is everything here that can improve learning, refine taste, and purify the heart. But I must remember that there is also everything here which can seduce, betray, deceive, deprave, corrupt, and debauch. John Adams was a major voice in Congress. He had been perhaps the most eloquent supporter of independence before July 1776. He certainly had won the respect of the other delegates uh, by his eloquence and by his strong commitment to the American cause. He was straightforward. He said what he thought. 
But those strengths did not necessarily make him a good diplomat. He can't dance, drink, game, flatter, promise, dress, swear with gentlemen, make small talk, or flirt with the ladies. In short, he has none of the essential qualities to make him a courtier. Nobody could be less suited to be a diplomat in any court in Europe than John Adams. He has no social skills. More to the point, he never wanted to acquire any. Uh, Adams comes into the Paris scene as sort of the bull in the china shop. You can just picture Franklin going, oh my God, everything I've done here, all the groundwork I've laid, this idiot can destroy in five minutes. Adams, who had left America two months earlier, is surprised to find on his arrival that the alliance with France had been concluded before he even left home. At Franklin's invitation, he takes up residence at Passy. But his mood is not improved by his intense and growing jealousy of Franklin's fame in France. It doesn't help that at parties he is introduced as the collègue de Monsieur Franklin. When he tells them his name, he is then asked if he is the famous Adams, meaning Samuel Adams. I had to tell them that I was not le fameux Adams. So then it was settled. I'm the American that nobody's heard of, a man of no consequence, a zero, particularly when compared with le fameux Franklin. John Adams freaks out when he sees how Franklin is getting ahead in French society and presumably conducting American mission in France. Adams found Franklin's willingness to curry the favor of the French government ultimately inappropriate and intolerable. And while Franklin fully recognized that the United States had almost no leverage with France, that the United States could get what it needed only by tending closely to French interests. To Adams, that was anathema. Adams wanted to stand up for American interests against France if necessary, just as America had been standing up for American interests against Britain. Mr. Adams persists in thinking that France is the greatest enemy of America. He thinks that gratitude towards France is the greatest of follies, that it will ruin us. He makes no secret of his opinions, indeed expresses them publicly, sometimes in the presence of English ministers. This court must be treated with delicacy, and it is my intention, while I am here, to procure what advantages I can for our country by trying to please this court. An expression of gratitude is not only our duty, but also very much in our interest. Anything which our countryman does to displease France, I'll try to prevent. John Adams could have been in France for the next millennium and never gotten a, a sou out of the, uh, the French. And, uh, and only Franklin's approach has a prayer of working with, uh, with the French. But, uh, but Adams is just livid that Franklin is getting someplace for nothing. And Adams, who's working so hard, is getting no place. The life of Dr. Franklin here in France is one long party. He eats breakfast late in the morning, and as soon as his breakfast is over, crowds of people come to his court, philosophers, academics, his literary friends, even women and children, thrilled at the great honor of viewing his bald head, listening to him telling stories about his simplicity. Well, by then, it's the afternoon, time to dress for dinner. Dr. Franklin never turns down a dinner invitation. He seldom comes home before nine, and sometimes as late as midnight. I'd be happy to do all the work myself. All I want is a few moments a day for him to sign letters or give advice on what's to be done. He has time for everyone else but me. By 1780, Franklin has been in France for almost four years. He has yet to persuade the French to send troops to American soil. The situation is becoming critical. 
Since Saratoga, there have been few victories, and now the British have invaded the South. Death and disease have spread from the army to the civilian population. The American economy has collapsed, and now, with no money for supplies or pay, Washington's army is facing widespread desertion. A desperate Congress is urging Franklin to prod the French for more help. And with no collateral to offer, the United States is dependent more than ever on French goodwill. John Adams chooses this moment to loudly proclaim his distrust of the French. I will be buried in the ocean before I voluntarily put our country into French chains, just as I'm struggling to throw off those of Great Britain. Adams goes so far as to send Vergen unsolicited advice on how France should be conducting the war. Mr. Adams, when I gave you a mark of my confidence by informing you about the movement of French fleets, I really didn't expect, as thanks, a list of criticisms of our strategy. To avoid further discussions of this sort, I now inform you that in the future I will be dealing only with Mr. Franklin on all matters that concern the King and the United States. I also remind you that the King does not require any further advice from you in these affairs. Comte de Vergennes, I wish to make it clear that Mr. Adams's indiscretion is entirely his own. I live on terms of civility with him, not intimacy. Relations broke down between Vergennes and Adams so dramatically in 1780 that Vergennes sent Franklin copies of all Adams's letters to him which was a very uh, unusual and desperate move to take. He said to Franklin, I would like you to show these to the American Congress and have Adams recalled. Mr. Adams has offended the court here with several letters he has written. He did not show them to me before he sent them. He is creating suspicions that are endangering our support and our friendship with France. He imagines that Count Vergennes and myself are continually plotting against him, that we are planting articles in the newspapers to belittle his character and other such fancies. I am persuaded that he means well for the country, that he is an honest man and a wise man, but in some things he is absolutely out of his senses. Congress sends Adams to Holland to try to extract a loan from the Dutch. Arthur Lee had been recalled the year before. Franklin is relieved to be rid of his troublesome colleagues, but the full weight of the mission now rests on his shoulders alone. Winter 1780. Franklin is working day and night trying to assemble shipments of weapons and supplies. To pay for them, he is signing numerous loan certificates to the French government, worthless because America is bankrupt. The French treasury is stretched to its limits. Vergen has hinted to Franklin that France is considering peace negotiations with England. Back in America, Certain members of Congress are losing confidence in Franklin's ability to get results. The French Navy is still in the Caribbean, and though the French have sent an army to America, it is sitting idle in Rhode Island, waiting for reinforcements. Congress is blaming Franklin for France's inaction, and there is serious talk of replacing him. He makes a preemptive strike. To the President of Congress, I'm now past 75 years old. I have just had another severe fit of the gout which has shaken me, and I have yet to recover my physical strength. I'm finding that the business is too heavy for me, and I fear that the affairs of the country are beginning to suffer. I've been engaged in public affairs, and I've enjoyed public confidence for 50 long years now. I have no other ambition left but to get some rest I hope that Congress will grant me one last request, to send some person to France to replace me. 
Congress doesn't dare call Franklin's bluff. They insist that he stay on. And Franklin admits in a later letter to a friend that he regards that reappointment as more important than his first appointment because his enemies in Congress wanted his replacement. And even with their demanding it and his supporting it in the letter, they don't do it. They want him there. They need him. One night in November of 1781, Franklin and his friend Elkanah Watson stay up late talking about the war. They have news from America that the French army and navy are finally on the move, attempting a highly difficult military campaign. Because it takes over a month for news to cross the Atlantic, they have no idea how the plan has turned out. We talked that night only about the great combined military operation to take on Wallace in Virginia. All evening long, we pored over the maps and weighed all the possibilities. Franklin was suspended between hope and fear. One moment he would be in gloomy despondency, and then, looking at the situation in another way, he would flash into a conviction of complete success. And when this 75-year-old man became exhilarated, his whole body assumed a state of elasticity, of active play. I didn't share his optimism. Went home around 11 o'clock, saddened over the fate of my country. One hour later, at midnight, a messenger arrives at Passy with startling news. The French and American armies and the French Navy have surrounded and taken the entire British army at Yorktown. Washington could never have won at Yorktown. He didn't know how to lay down a, a siege. He, he was a, a militia colonel. Uh, he, he learned a lot during his eight years of fighting, but the French army and the French participation and the French naval isolation of Cornwallis was absolutely crucial. It is an American victory. It is a French victory. And it is a victory for Benjamin Franklin's diplomacy. Mon cher papa, do you know why your neighbor has not written to you in a while? Because I am sulking. Yes, Monsieur Papa, I am sulking because of you. Here you take entire armies in America, and we, your poor neighbors, have to read about it in the newspapers. We were getting drunk drinking to your aid, to that of Washington, to Independence, to the King, to Lafayette, and not one word from you. So I'm left only to imagine that you must be overjoyed. You must suddenly have become 20 years younger upon hearing the news. And you will lead us to lasting peace after this glorious victory. I, I will continue to sulk until I hear from you. To Madame Brion, my dear friend. It was a great victory, but I am not celebrating yet. War is a very uncertain thing. I play this game exactly like you've seen me play chess. I do not assume victory until the last move is made. Despite the British defeat at Yorktown, the war is not yet over. Hardliners in Parliament are still not willing to give up. Franklin decides to jumpstart negotiations. Nine years earlier in England, he had amazed some friends with his trick of pouring oil on rough waters. The demonstration took place on the estate of the Earl of Shelburne. Franklin knows that Shelburne is sympathetic to the American cause. Perhaps the old conjurer will once again be able to smooth troubled waters. Lord Shelburne, I assure you of my total respect for your talents and virtues. I'm sure your lordship, along with all good men, desires a general peace. For my own part, I shall, to my dying breath, contribute everything in my power to this end. Franklin's timing is exquisite. Opposition to the war has just brought down the British government. Franklin's old friend Shelburne is now Secretary of State and soon will be Prime Minister. This back-channel diplomacy has succeeded in laying the foundations for a peace treaty. But Franklin will not remain the sole negotiator. Congress has appointed two other men to work on the peace commission. 
first, John Jay arrives. A wealthy New Yorker and former president of Congress, he hates France almost more than he hates England. As for the third American commissioner, Count Vergen groans when he hears the name. John Adams. He has a rigidity, an arrogance, and an obstinacy which will drive the negotiators to despair. The stakes are high. All three commissioners know that in the treaty negotiations, everything is on the table. The very borders of the United States have to be determined. Even independence itself may be sacrificed to the wider aims of the large European powers. The French had their own issues. They wanted to retrieve some of the losses from the last war with Britain. The Spanish had their own issues. They wanted to get Gibraltar back. From Franklin's perspective in Paris, things only got more complicated because the United States was now immersed in the diplomacy among the major European powers. Shelburne sends an envoy to the American. If he can get them to sign a treaty directly with England, England will be in a much stronger negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis the French. Franklin at first resists the idea of cutting the French out of the negotiating process. The true political interests of America consist in observing with complete exactitude the commitments we made to France. It is our connection with France which gives us weight with England and respect throughout Europe. If we were to break with France, England would again trample us and every other nation would despise us. I told him that the only treaty America would sign was one in concert with France. Jay and Adams are not convinced. They both believe that Franklin is in the pocket of the French. Jay particularly does not trust Vergen and believes that he is stalling on the peace in order to get the best deal for the French. The French court chooses to delay an acceptance of our independence by England until they make peace with England. They wish to keep us under their control until they get what they want from the peace. Count Vergen still calls us colonies. He would have us only deal with the British through him. Behind Franklin's back, Jay and Adams determine to accept the British proposal and sideline France. Adams confronts Franklin. I told Franklin that I supported Jay's principles and firmness. To share details of the treaty with the French would be like committing the lamb to the custody of the wolf. I supported the idea of a separate treaty without reserve. Franklin has spent his six years in France building up a bond of trust with Vergen. Troubled by the belligerent tactics of his two younger colleagues, he debates what to do. Honor the terms of the original alliance, or go behind Vergen's back, betray France, and agree to a separate treaty with England. Franklin understood, grateful as he was to the French, and appreciative as he was for their help, and honorable as everyone had been, that he'd better get for America what he could get without waiting to follow the French lead. Franklin makes the difficult decision to go along with Jay and Adams. The master chess player sees that the young United States is in a strong position. Shelburne is so anxious to damage the French-American alliance that he is willing to give the Americans almost everything they are asking for. Vergen discovers that he has been double-crossed. I'm astonished. The British seem to buy peace rather than make it. The treaty is like a dream for the Americans, exceeding everything I should have thought possible. Our position in negotiating with Lord Shelburne has been seriously compromised. We knew nothing of the details, which were completed in the most sudden, unforeseen, and I may say, extraordinary manner. Franklin's letter to Vergen is a classic of diplomatic history. I can assure your excellency that nothing in this agreement is contrary to the interests of France. But you are correct in saying that we should have consulted you before we signed it. It was an error of propriety, not want of respect for the king, whom we all love and honor. I've just learned that the English flatter themselves in thinking that they have succeeded in dividing France and America. 
I hope this little misunderstanding between us will be kept secret so that they will find themselves totally mistaken. It's a masterpiece of diplomatic effrontery. He ends the letter by asking for more money. I accuse no one. I do not blame even Mr. Franklin. He yielded perhaps too easily to the impulses of his colleagues who affect to ignore the rules of courtesy. If we can judge the future by what we have just seen, we shall be poorly repaid for what we have done for the United States of America. You have to give credit to all three of them. I think both the British and the French thought that this was going to be easy going. The French thought they would take what they wanted, and the English thought that they could put one over on the Americans. They might get independence recognized, but they weren't going to get much else. And both the English and the French admitted that these fellows had performed a heck of a lot better than anyone expected them to. The Treaty of Paris was uh, a, a marvelous uh, achievement in many, many ways. For instance, uh, at one point, uh, uh, some of Franklin's fellow diplomats were ready to uh, give away the right to navigate the Mississippi, which Franklin, with this marvelous vision of the future, saw would be essential once Americans populated the Northwest. And Franklin said, I'd soon as give away the Mississippi as I'd give away my back door. What Franklin understood was that the United States needed to have territory to expand into. And that was the greatest achievement of the peace treaty that he got with the British government. The expansion of American boundaries from the Atlantic clear to the Mississippi River. The Treaty of Paris really guaranteed the American future. It's in the same league as the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. It was that important. On September 3, 1783, nearly two years after the victory at Yorktown, the final treaty is signed and all hostilities cease. Parisians celebrate the peace with fireworks in front of City Hall. Though Franklin has had many triumphs in his long life, this latest one is the greatest of them all. In 1785, Congress appoints Thomas Jefferson as the new ambassador to France and agrees to let Franklin retire. Madame Brion, the brilliant, is too distraught to see her old friend off. At the age of 79, Benjamin Franklin sails home to America. In many ways, his final years will be the happiest of his life. During his long stay in France, he has had little time for science. Now, on the voyage home, he organizes decades of thinking and experimentation. In three major scientific papers, he describes his latest theories on everything from the Gulf Stream to how to make ships unsinkable. Philadelphia is now a thriving city, the capital of the new country. Much of its prominence is due to the many institutions, the library, the hospital, the college, that Franklin himself had helped found. He settles into the house near Market Street that he and his late wife Deborah had built two decades earlier. His daughter Sally and his six grandchildren are nearby. The increasing infirmities of old age become one more occasion for scientific inquiry. I have found that deafness will considerably diminish one's pleasure in conversation. But it is easily remedied by putting your hand behind your ear and pressing it outward with the hollow of your hand. I did an experiment and I found that I could hear the tick of a watch 45 feet away using this method. Franklin's health is deteriorating, but not his sense of humor. 
He suggests that the predatory eagle is not the right symbol for the fledgling country. In its stead, he proposes a useful bird, the turkey. In compensation for all his services to his country, Franklin has asked Congress for two things, a grant of land in the West and a job for one of his grandchildren. Congress gives him nothing, not even his expenses for his years in France. It's sort of inexplicable that after all Franklin had done, uh, he was not greeted with laurel wreath and flower petals strewn. I think some of it is because America had found its hero in George Washington. If you immortalize Washington, you say, the Americans who starved at Valley Forge triumphed because God was on our side, truth and justice were on our side. If you immortalize Franklin, then you say, we couldn't have done it without France. And so when you pick your heroes to revere, you're also picking the myth about yourself that you want to tell. At a time of life when most people become more conservative, Franklin is becoming more radical. Never one to accept the status quo, he takes a public stand against a fundamental institution of American society, slavery. Can the pleasure of sweetening our tea with sugar grown by slaves make up for all the misery produced among our fellow creatures? The butchery of the human species by this detestable traffic in the bodies and souls of men. As a young man, Franklin accepted slavery as just the way the world worked. He owned a couple of personal servants himself. He engaged in buying and selling slaves through his various business enterprises. And he unthinkingly accepted the assumption that Africans were inferior in intelligence to Europeans. This assumption was challenged when he visited a school where young black children were being educated. And he discovered that these children, these African-American children, were learning just as quickly as white kids of the same age. He changed his whole theory and was willing to go exactly the opposite direction to, to uh, encourage their education and also to argue for the end of slavery and became, uh, in, in the final years of his life, uh, a great radical on that issue. In 1787, Franklin accepts the presidency of America's first abolitionist society. He is the only one of the founding fathers to actively campaign against slavery. That summer in Philadelphia, delegates from the separate states gathered to write a constitution for the new country. Franklin, old and sick, has to be carried to the convention hall. The debates are long and rancorous, and the final document is highly controversial. The delegates know that most Americans are still passionately attached to states' rights. Many regard the Constitution as threatening the freedoms men have fought and died for. James Madison is deeply disillusioned with the final results because some of his pet things are, are omitted. And he writes a letter to Jefferson which says, I don't think it's going to work. And Washington is reputed to have said, this thing won't last 20 years. Everybody knew that this document, which was a radical proposal, was going to have a very difficult time getting ratified. And there was hardly a member of the convention that approved of the whole thing. It was a bundle of compromises. Nobody got exactly what they wanted, and many were very suspicious of the document. Franklin ends the convention with a seemingly simple speech. In it, he draws on a lifetime of skills as a diplomat and negotiator. No ringing phrases or calls to battle, but rather a plea for compromise. This is his last public statement, and perhaps his greatest. 
I don't entirely approve of this constitution at present. I'm not sure I'll ever approve of it, but I'm also not sure I'm right. I've lived a long time, and the longer I live, the more I begin to doubt my own infallibility, the more I begin to respect the judgment of others. We've collected together men who not only have great wisdom, but also prejudices, selfish views, and local interests. From such an assembly, we can't expect a perfect production. It astonishes me that we have come as close to perfection as we did. It will astonish our enemies, who think of our separate states coming together only to cut each other's throats. So I consent to this constitution because I expect no better, and because I'm not absolutely convinced that it is not the best. Nobody, including Franklin, expected the Constitution to last for 200 years. They saw it as an experiment, as a, a try at solving the problem of a central intensive government for a series of states. What he was pleading for was ratification so the experiment could be run. In some ways, the federal Constitution was the end and the most important experiment to which Franklin was committed in a life in which he made his name as an experimentalist. Franklin signs the document with the flourished signature of his youth. He is the only person to have his name on the three documents that created this country. The Declaration of Independence, the Peace Treaty with England, and the United States Constitution. In 1790, at the age of 84, Benjamin Franklin dies at home. 20,000 people attend his funeral. Not only the high and the mighty, but the ordinary tradesmen from whose ranks he had risen. When news of his death reaches France, that country is in the throes of its own revolution. King Louis will soon be overthrown, in part because he bankrupted France with his support of the American War. The French Assembly immediately announces an official countrywide period of mourning. Benjamin Franklin, the man of humble roots, who had snatched lightning from the gods and a scepter from tyrants, is, for the French, a symbol of the new order they hope to establish. For Americans, Franklin's legacy would be much more complex. In the century following his death, he was mythologized as the patron saint of success through hard work and diligence. Franklin's autobiography led Mark Twain to complain that Franklin was the author of a vicious conspiracy against every boy growing up in America because that boy's father could point to the autobiography and said, young Ben was able to do this at age so-and-so, and you, you out, are incapable of it. There's an important and highly significant fact that Franklin suppresses from the autobiography. He never tells you that he's a genius. In our own time, the magnitude of Franklin's achievements continues to astonish. After 782 pages, his biographer Carl Van Doren gave up trying to sum him up. He wrote that Franklin seemed to be not one person, but a harmonious human multitude. Well, I often say, you know, that when we look for Ben Franklin's legacy, we don't have to look far. Because each and every one of us is Ben Franklin's living legacy. And I think he'd come back and he'd look at the street lights and the paved streets and the fire companies and the schools, and he would see himself and his ideas and hope for us reflected in all those things. The real distinction between Franklin and the rest of the founding fathers was that Franklin takes great pride in being a tradesman. And he believes that the foundation of American democracy is not some elite, not some aristocracy, but the middle class shopkeeper who's learned who cares about civic life and can participate in democracy. 
I think what Franklin demonstrates is the importance of intellectual flexibility. He was profoundly interested in issues and was willing to change his convictions according to observations. Let the experiment be made. That was his philosophy. Franklin was born at a time when witches were thought to be real, and he died at the dawn of the modern age. It is an age that, to a surprising degree, he himself helped shape. He came from a society where class determined one's station in life, and he helped create a country where merit and ability could flourish. In a rigid world of orthodoxy and dogma, he believed to the core of his soul in the virtues of tolerance and compromise. The quintessential optimist, he never doubted, even for a moment, that the future of humanity lay in the infinite power of human reason. The rapid progress of the sciences makes me, at times, sorry that I was born so soon. Imagine the power that man will have over matter a few hundred years from now. We may learn how to remove gravity from large masses and float them over great distances. Agriculture will double its produce with less labor. All diseases will surely be cured, <laughs> even old age. If only the moral sciences could be improved as well. Perhaps men would cease to be wolves to one another, and human beings could learn to be human. Explore the amazing life of Benjamin Franklin at PBS Online. Recreate famous experiments. Sample Ben's wit and wisdom and discover how his ideas shape our world. Log on to pbs.org. Major funding for Benjamin Franklin is provided by the Northwestern Mutual Foundation. The people of Northwestern Mutual are proud to have supported this remarkable series on PBS, celebrating the wisdom and ingenuity of one of America's most distinguished founding fathers. Major funding is also provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities, expanding America's understanding of who we were, who we are, and who we will be. The Pew Charitable Trusts, investing in ideas, returning results. Additional funding is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for Public Understanding of Science and Technology, the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, by these funders, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. to excite curiosity in Paris. Uh, people cluster around him as he walks down the street and ask, who is this old peasant who has such a noble air? Franklin wants to oblige their expectations. He decides to present himself as an authentic American rustic. They want it, they'll get it. He is the American from Central Casting. When Franklin first arrives in France, he is wearing a fur hat, simply to keep his head warm. The frontiersman's hat causes a sensation. For the French, it is proof that its wearer is a true, natural man. Franklin, who has never lived out of a city, now sends back to Pennsylvania for great supplies of these coonskin caps that he's never worn in his life. All the attention surprises even the master publicist himself, he writes with amusement to his daughter. 
My picture is everywhere. On the lids of snuff boxes, on rings, busts. The numbers sold are incredible. My portrait's a bestseller. You have prints and copies of prints and copies of copies spread everywhere. Your father's face is now as well known as the man in the moon. Franklin's mission is top secret. He is ostensibly visiting France as a private citizen. From the moment of his arrival, all Paris has been abuzz with rumors. Nobody really knows what he is up to. Lord Stormont, British ambassador to the French court, reports back to London. Some people think that the famous stuff. If the Americans did not get French help, the American Revolution almost certainly would fail. We were incredibly fortunate that Franklin was willing to do it. There's no diplomatic core in existence. There's barely a government. So that it has, it has to be an informal, personal mission. And Franklin, because he had the personal recognition over there, was the one diplomat who could do it. When Franklin arrives in Paris in December 1776, it is a far cry from the city of light, the wide open boulevards and stunning architecture of later years. The average Parisian lives in abject poverty, in narrow, crooked streets with open sewers running down the middle. Starving beggars and homeless families are everywhere. In the elegant mansions near the Tuileries Gardens, where the poor are forbidden to go, the upper classes prepare for their soirees. No elegant face is complete without the application of at least one mouche originally used to disguise smallpox scars. Elaborate wigs are placed over bald heads, shaven to discourage lice. At Versailles, King Louis XVI and his queen, Marie Antoinette, preside over a world of idle luxury. This is the society to which the former printer from Philadelphia will have to gain access. In 1776, Benjamin Franklin is 70 years old. His wife and most of his contemporaries are dead. But far from retiring, he is about to face one of the most difficult challenges of his long life. Before setting off for France, he had been in the forefront of the revolutionary cause. In June, he had assisted in the writing of the Declaration of Independence. Now in October, the war is in full cry and so far has been disastrous for the new nation. George Washington's army has suffered decisive defeats at Long Island, White Plains, Fort Washington, and Fort Lee. Britain has the most well-disciplined, well-supplied, well-stocked army and navy in the world. America has virtually nothing. America was just this sort of young, new, marginal place. We couldn't beat the most powerful nation on the planet without someone's help. It just wasn't going to happen. If the Americans got French help, preeminently an Amer a French alliance, French weapons, then the revolution had a chance of succeeding. He already has one powerful weapon, his reputation. The general public in Paris already then idolized Franklin. People had read Poor Richard. They, had, they knew about the way to wealth. They knew about his writings. They were very proud that the theory of electricity and lightning had been proved in France for the first time. He was 
the embodiment of all they thought America to be. There was a vogue for things American in France at this time. Many French intellectuals looked to America as a new world, as a fresh world, as a world where human nature was closer to its natural origins than the human nature that one found in the confines of Europe. And so Franklin arrived from America, and presumably he shared some of this noble savage character. Franklin is kind of the natural genius whose development has not been fettered by a European court. He's flourished. His intellect has, has sprung beautiful shoots in the American wilderness. And the French are absolutely entranced by this kind of native genius. The most surprising thing is the contrast between the luxury of our capital, the, the elegance of our fashions, the, the magnificence of Versailles, the polite haughtiness of our nobility, and Benjamin Franklin. Everything about him announces the simplicity and innocence of the natural man. His clothing is rustic. His bearing is simple but dignified. His language is direct and his hair unpowdered. Such a person is made October 1776. Benjamin Franklin prepares for his voyage to France. His only living sister is convinced that she will never see him again. I cannot bear the thought of you going abroad again. You positively must not go. You've served the public beyond any other man. Into your old age, let some younger person now take on this painful work. Do as much good here as Congress thinks proper. Your talents are certainly superior to other men. But brother, don't go. Pray, don't go. With great secrecy, Franklin leaves Philadelphia on a ship aptly named the Reprisal. His mission is of the utmost urgency. The Americans don't have a hope of winning the revolution unless they can secure an alliance with England's most powerful rival, France. I think that the whole endeavor was stark staring mad. Franklin has to do this impossible thing, or this almost impossible thing, to persuade the French to join this war. As much as the fate of the revolution is in George Washington's hands with the army on land, it's with Franklin as he crosses the sea. I will do anything my fellow citizens think proper. As the shopkeeper says about his short ends of cloth, use me for anything you want. I'm old and good for nothing but rags.